recording. So the lesson starts now. All right. Um, so the thing that we didn't get to at the end is a very useful tool. It's called the squeeze theorem. Before I introduce it, I need to introduce another theorem. This, this is literally box two theorem in your book. So I don't know what to call it as a name, but it's just box two. It's the second theorem from section 2.3. And it's needed for uh, the squeeze theorem, which comes next and actually has a name. So if we've got two functions, f of x and g of x, and there's this comparison between the two. We know that f is always less than or equal to the second of g. Okay. Okay. If this is the case when x is near a, so a is just going to be some number and x is going to be a number close to a, um, then we know this. The limit as x goes to a of f and the limit as x goes to a of g share what comparison with this one? They share the same comparison. They, we know this is true for sure, provided the limits exist. which I will now draw. So this is going to be f. We'll say f looks like this. g is going to look odd until it comes right up in here, close to a. saying, if we have this relationship between f and g, that in this little neighborhood around a, g is always bigger than or equal to this one. So the graph is above. Then what we know about the limits of our functions at this point, the left-hand limit, the right-hand limit, agree. The left hand limit, the right hand limit agree. So the functions limits exist. What we can say about their limits is that the limit at G is bigger than the limit at, at A for F and G. That's what I meant to say. Okay? What this is not saying is that this function is always bigger than this one. So my graph shows that. Okay? F can definitely be bigger than G. But Close to A, we need the opposite to occur. Okay? Here's another thing this graph is not, or this theorem is not saying. <clears throat> what if our functions have poles at A? And what if our function F, which is green, pops up here at A, and G pops down to here at A. This theorem still applies. Okay. The limits don't care what the function's value is at A, 
Remember that that's kind of what I've been preaching here. You can't just always plug it in. It's great when you can, but you can't always. Limits only care about the approach. So the approach from the left and right of red appears to be the blank spot in this circle. The limit of this green one from the left and from the right appears to be this blank spot. Those are the limits. Those are not the actual function values there. Okay? But this is a really kind of like a really useful theorem because it allows us immediately to write down this thing called the squeeze theorem. So now we're just going to introduce another function that is bigger than our function g. Because we can say this in both directions, right? We could switch, uh, switch f and g, and that would just switch these limits around. Right? So this works in both ways. If we know this is true, then we know this is true. Yeah? So if I gave you a bigger function than the latter one, then we know that the bigger function is larger than... It doesn't matter which direction this is. The argument's exactly the same. So if I give you now another function that's bigger than g, and we bound it g by 2, then we can say something about the limits of all three of them in comparison. So this is called the squeeze theorem. And the idea is right in the title. It's a great title. We're going to use two functions that we know have nice properties to sort of squeeze the unknown one and get information about the unknown one from the other two. So let f of x be less than or equal to g of x be less than or equal to h of x. Uh, same statement here when x is close to a and the limit of x goes to a of f equals the limit of x goes to a of h. We've got a function that's always below this middle function close to a. We've got another function that is always above it when we get close to a. The limits of the lesser function and the superior function are the same at A. So what is the limit as x goes to A of the intermediate function? Exactly. example last time. Do you remember what happened with this function sine of 1 over x close to 0? It just like oscillated crazy, right? It was just nice and slow and then this sort of thing happened. It was like that, right? Not a great function. We tried to take limits and it just sort of didn't work. Can you tell me about the values of sine of 1 over x? It's always between what and what? Minus 1 and 1. Okay, always definitely between negative 1 and 1. Okay, not so much, not, not very helpful for a squeeze theorem yet, right? But what if I now take this function and modify it 
by, say, oh, I don't know, like multiplying by x squared, x squared sine of 1 over x. What are the inequalities now in regards to? x squared is definitely positive, so we're not multiplying by negatives across these inequalities, which means they stay the same direction. Sine squared, oh, sine of 1 over x divided by, <coughs> starting over, x squared times sine of 1 over x is definitely between negative x squared, definitely, and it's less than or equal to positive x squared, right? Okay, what does this x squared sine of 1 over x looks, look like? It has these oscillations that are huge and happen a lot, a lot, a lot here in the middle, with crazy frequencies, but sine of 1 over x times x squared looks like this. This function here, negative x squared, sort of rides the boundary here. x squared is a parabola from above. And we definitely have this situation here because we know the sign is always between negative 1 and 1. So let's apply the squeeze theorem here to find this. This is something we can readily apply the squeeze theorem to. What is it? Well, let's step through the squeeze theorem. We need a function that's smaller than it, close to zero. We need a function that's bigger than it, close to zero. Those are our candidates. So f is negative x squared, which is less than or equal to x squared sine of 1 over x near 0. We're going to say our superior function is x squared, because that's bigger than or equal to x squared sine of 1 over x near 0. Yes? How is it bigger? So, sine is always bounded by negative 1 and 1, right? Like, it, it's never going to be a number bigger than 1. Okay, so now take this inequality, sine 1 over x less than or equal to 1. If I multiply both sides of this inequality by a positive number, any positive number, the inequality stays the same, right? It's right. so like, if I took 10 times this and 10 times that, that's still the same, right? Okay. If I did this with negatives, then it flips. Just basic inequality math. Okay? So let's let's say I'm going to multiply both sides by a positive number. So take any number and square it. That's positive. That maintains this inequality which means that x squared sine of 1 over x is less than or equal to x squared. Okay, and we do the same thing to show this. The inequality just flipped. Okay, perfect. Any other questions? Okay. What are the limits of negative x squared and x squared when we go to 0, when x goes to 0? x squared is polynomial, so we throw caution to the wind and plug in zero. Both of them have the same limit. So we've got something 
bigger that has a limit of zero, of zero. We've got something smaller which has a limit of zero. So the thing that's in between the two must have the same limit because it's constantly being squeezed between them. oscillation near zero and just say, who cares? We've squeezed them all down to a point. The fact that they're oscillating back and forth doesn't even matter anymore. We've, in a sense, tamed the oscillations or you know, bounded them above and bounded them below. Questions about this? Can you tell me about the value of 0 squared times sine of 1 over 0 compared to these other values? Can you make any comparisons? No, because the squeeze theorem doesn't tell you anything about the values at that thing. The previous theorem, box 2 theorem, told you nothing about the values at that limit point. It told you only the value, the limit values comparisons. Okay? This is undefined. How, I mean, how does that compare to zero? I don't know. The squeeze theorem doesn't tell us anything about that. Okay? Okay. So it's kind of an important thing. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, kind of emphasizes the importance of having nice functions in your wheelhouse, nice functions you know about in your wheelhouse, so that you can sort of use them as estimators of some other weirder, harder function. Okay? So like, you know, like the, in algebra, you're always being asked to simplify things, right? Um, this is kind of like a calculus simplification question. You know, simplify an x squared sine of 1 over x if you said if you said x squared, I'd be like, okay, it's pretty simple. That's basically the same thing, right? Because it, it pretty closely approximates it. So this is a nice little tool, the squeeze theorem, to use those simpler functions to approximate more difficult functions. And that is it for two point three. We are skipping 2.4. If you've looked ahead, this is the precise definition of a limit. So I'm just going to say a remark about this. And then I'm going to move on. My remark is this, is that Sorry, I've lied to you. When I when I've said before, in the computations of limits, it doesn't really matter how you approach. That was kind of a, a lie. Because how you approach a limit things that aren't true. <clears throat> and the example was the sine of 1 over x. I could easily solve this. You could too. 
what is x in a function form? If I know sine of an angle equals 1, how do I get that angle back as the output? I compose with inverses. So I say sine inverse of 1 equals 1 over x. Sine inverse of sine of 1 over x, right? Sine inverse of 1, this is a giant list. If I take the unrestricted sine, this is a giant list of angles, right? So now if I solve for x, or rather, I don't even, I'm not even going to do that. If in taking my limit of sine of 1 over x on that table that I made on the computer, if I had just plugged in these values from this list, what would the table's outputs look like? It would look like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So it would definitely look like the limit was 1. So this whole language of like getting close to, it's kind of ambiguous because the approach that you pick might not give you the correct value or the impression of the correct value. Um, and so this whole, this whole section is about the precise definitions of limits. And so it, it sort of takes all of the approaches and says, very generically, it doesn't matter how you approach, if you satisfy a certain requirement in your approach and you still get this value out, then you're okay. That's the value for the limit. So that's it for 2.4. Um, the remark is just how you approach the limit. Okay, that's it. This isn't enough, you know, an approach isn't enough. You need to make sure that all approaches work. And there's a precise way to do that, which we're not going to cover. 2.5! Hooray! Is on continuity. This is a huge topic. Huge topic. Have I asked you this question before? I don't think I have. You make a square with nine dots, and then I say draw or sorry, connect all nine dots with four straight lines. I think I have. And here's the kicker, without, without picking up your pencil. Okay, or backtracking. <clears throat> so you gotta try and draw four straight lines without picking up your pencil. That's the kicker. In relation to what we're doing. What I'm asking you to do in this problem is make a continuous path. You can't have any gaps in it. You can't have, can't have any breaks in it. It needs to be a nice continuous thing. Solution, well, maybe I will. I'm not going to point you at the solution. We'll see. You. I can't remember if I asked it or not, but I'm not going to point you at the solution. That's a good hint. Um, continuity, back in the day when it was first sort of conceived, um, a continuous function, this is how it was defined. Is, this is like really funny stuff, that which can be drawn freely with the hand. Back when there was like no precise language to talk about these things in sort of like the infancy of calculus, and people started talking about continuous functions, uh, they said, oh, Anything you can draw freely with the hand. Oh, freely, but that's continuous. Okay, freely, great. Okay? Um, that's not the definition that we're going to look at today, but this is the impression. If you can draw it without picking up your pen or pencil, 
it's a continuous function. Okay? Okay. I saw a hand come up. Did you have a question? No, I just figured out how to solve the puzzle. Nice. Did the hand work? Yeah, see? I popped it. Do you all know the uh, show Fool Us with Penn and Teller? No? Yeah, it's like a magic show and magicians come on and they have to fool Penn and Teller, who are famous magicians. You ever seen it? Okay. Well, they always talk to the magicians after the fact and they, it's like encoded. Exactly what they did is in what they said to them, but only the magicians know those code words. So I'm glad you got to him. Yes? So how do you solve it? Oh, oh, I said I would, I'm not going to point you at the solution. That's, that's what I'm talking about, that code right there. I just told you about the solution, but you didn't know it. So here is our definition of continuity. A function f is continuous at a, a is just a value in its domain. Okay, if function f is continuous at a, if the following things are true. The limit as x goes to a of our function f exists, and equals f at a. Piecing this together into a picture, here's something I've drawn freely with my hand. Here's A. If we take the left hand limit, we see that it agrees with the right hand limit. And in fact, if I take the exact value at A, it's right there as well. This function is continuous at A. I'm going to use the same graph now, but introduce a discontinuity. So from the definition, how can we know it's not continuous at B? So we look at the limit as X goes to B. We look at the left-hand limit. It looks like it's right here. The right hand limit looks like it's also right there. So the limit exists at its that point in that space. But what is f of b? It's up here. And that is not equal to the limit as x goes to b. So it's not continuous at b. Okay. All right. When we say something is not continuous, we use this word discontinuous, not continuous. It's called discontinuous. Okay. So it's discontinuous there and continuous somewhere else. Here's a function. Where is it discontinuous? Wouldn't it be a positive 2? Probably a positive 2. Great guess. Because that's not even in the domain. So you can't even tell me what half of 2 is.
we, we just can't. You try to plug in 2 and immediately you divide by 0 and you can't tell me that. So that's undefined. So you need to find the limit though. Yeah, what is the limit? Let's see if we can do this. Tell me this, do you know the limit of x minus 2 as x goes to 2? Yeah? It's not, not so hard. What is it? The closer x gets to 2, the closer x minus 2 gets to. Plug in numbers closer and closer to 2, and uh, wouldn't you know x minus 2 gets closer to 0? Okay, great. We also know this about our function. We can factor it like this. We know that this limit exists. How about this limit? <laughs> plus 1. X plus 1 is the limit. So. Do you know this limit? Does it exist? Can we use the previous rules that we knew or know to determine then what this limit is? Maybe. Right? I see a product of two functions and I see a quotient of functions. We know rules for taking limits of quotients and products of functions. We could try and apply those. Or we could simplify the function down and maybe just use one of these. And that's how it's done. We take this, we cancel this out. Wouldn't you know that the limit of x plus 1 is 3 is the same as the limit of our original function. And that's definitely not an undefined number. That's just what it is. Okay, you can check that if you wanted to with making some tables. Needless to say, it's not continuous. The limit does not agree with the actual value there. Okay, just like we did before with talking about intervals of numbers, we talked about numbers to begin with, and then we talked about sets of these numbers. We talked about intervals, right? We talked about unions of intervals and the real number line. Um, this is just continuous at a point. Right? That's the thing that we've just talked about. Con continuity at a point. Now we're going to talk about continuity on an interval. So function f is continuous on an interval. Okay, 
so if you took a function and just sort of made a list of all the places it was continuous, and then you put them all together in one big set, well then you would say it's continuous at everything in that set. Right? If that set happens to be an interval, then this is what you've got. The reason I took away the endpoints is because our definition of continuity required that the limit exists there, right? And limits exist if you can take both left and right hand limits, and they agree. But if I said, here's a graph of your function, A, B, I can take the right hand limit here, but I can't take the left hand limit. I can take the left hand limit here, but I can't take the right hand limit. So like the previous definition of continuity kind of falls apart. Um, you can fix this definition and the previous definition with a little bit of uh, extra machinery. So you say the closed interval, and then you add on an extra sentence saying, if the left hand limit at the right end point agrees with the value at the right end point, and if the left hand limit at the left end point agrees with the value at the left end point. But this is so much easier and nicer, and so that's what we're going to go with. Okay, so here's an example. What are we doing on time? Seven minutes. Okay, this will probably be the end of it. One minus. X. That's squared. Good. So, f of x is continuous on this end. According to this, we need to be able to show for this that at any point in negative 1 to 1, we can definitely find the limit. And we need to show that that limit agrees with the function's value at that point. So we're going to just say let negative 1 be less than some a and less than some 1. And you know what? We're going to let A just be anything in between negative 1 and 1. Okay? First, we're going to show this limit. Exists. And we're going to show that it's, in fact, equal to what you get when you plug in the value. This is like this is another layer of abstraction. Now instead of finding an exact limit, you're finding a limit at any number inside an interval. Okay, so this is like a little bit more difficult. We don't know what A is. So we have to go back to the previous lessons, uh, properties of limits, and see if there's anything we can use. see a difference inside this limit. Was there a rule that said anything about limits of differences? Mm -hmm. It is what? exist, which we don't quite yet know. There was another rule that we saw last time. We can do this one all by ourselves without any rules. 
Well, what about this one? I had a root law from last time. Right? And that root law said I can take a limit of a root and it would be the same as the root of the limit provided a couple of things. Going back, we could verify that that works. We just need to make sure that this limit is not negative. X, or sorry, A is some number between negative 1 and 1. So when you square it, it's never bigger than 1. And when you take 1 minus something that's not bigger than 1, you definitely have something that's positive still. So this is always going to be positive close to A. In fact, in, in our entire interval, no matter what A is. That's the root law from last time. This we can just rewrite like we had just a minute ago. We take this difference of function. So actually, we're, we're not going to do that. We're just going to say, what is that? 1 minus x squared? What kind of function is that? Oh, yeah, it is a difference of squares. OK, yeah, yeah. So you could factor that if you wanted, which would make it a product of lines, right? You could go on from there if you wanted to, but you don't need to do so much work. x squared is a term in a polynomial, right? So is 1. This is just a polynomial. And one of the things we said last time is if you're taking the limit of a polynomial, polynomials are very nice, they're very special, in that you can just plug in the limit value. And that's what you get. So this limit literally just turns into what you get when you plug in A, which does two things for us. It computes the limit. And it tells us that the limit is exactly what you get when you just plug in A. Those are the two things we need, that the limit exists and that the limit agrees with the actual value there. Those are the two things you need to show that something's continuous at a point. Okay, now, we didn't pick a specific point. We picked any point in that interval. Which means we've shown that it's continuous at every single number in that interval. Which is what we wanted to show. Clear? Time for Friday to be over, maybe? Okay, well, you have a weekend ahead of you. Take it easy, study a little bit of math, but maybe push some of it till Monday. I think you might need a break.